for in one hour is thy judgment come. Babylon falls quickly. Things can change very, very rapidly. See, if I end up running from the Lamb when He reappears, something has gone terribly wrong in my life. The Messiah not only has to fulfill all those Old Testament prophecies, not only does He have to die in the exact year that Daniel chapter 9 says, but He also has to accept the guilt of every human sin right before He dies and then die within that 24-hour period. I will pay the penalty and I will die that same day. God never forces the mind. So first Jesus prayed that those who follow him would be separated from the world based on what this book says right here. So God has his sign and the devil has his mark or his sign of authority. And it's up to us to decide which way we will go. Gracious Father, what a blessing it is to be able to come before you once again tonight. And I just want to pray your special anointing and blessing over everybody that is, is joining us here in the sanctuary and those that are joining us online and those that will be watching this sometime in the, in the future. Please uh, bring the, the vitality and the power that is so present in your word to, to life for us tonight, that we would be blessed, we would be refreshed, we would be quickened and renewed. We thank you. We pray your special anointing and blessing on Tim as he brings us the message tonight. We ask that you would speak to him and through him for all of our sake. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming, and it's uh, good to be with you once again. Our topic tonight is forgotten, a day to remember. And if that sounds like an oxymoron, then uh, hopefully by the end tonight, it won't sound quite so contradictory here. In 1959, a popular radio host named Peter Tripp decided to do a fundraising campaign for a children's charity. His idea was to go, I think he was trying to break a world record and see how long he could go broadcasting without a break or without sleeping. So he set himself up um, in Times Square, New York City, and he began broadcasting. And he broadcasted for a total of 201 hours without a break. That's over eight days long. Now you can see his picture there. I don't know which day this picture was taken, <clears throat> but uh, he's not looking too alert, is he? And uh, this experiment that he did uh, ended up taking a heavy toll on him. He, uh, by day three, he was cursing people that were walking by. He began hallucinating, believing that spiders were crawling out of his shoes. Um, he finished the experiment. Like I said, he made it eight days, uh, possibly broke that world record, but he did pay a pretty heavy price. Um, his friends and his family said he was never the same again after this. He ended up getting a divorce uh, shortly after this. A uh, sad reminder of how important rest is, right? Now we know we need physical rest. This is why we fall asleep every night, hopefully. And um, we're going to be talking tonight about rest. Now it's interesting that the world is really focused on rest. Uh, lately. Here's just a few headlines um, from the Christian world talking about the Sabbath. So here we have the Wesleyan Church, Reclaim the Sabbath, God's Gift for You. This is the Orthodox Christian Network, Reclaiming the Sabbath. Here's the Unitarian Universalist Church, same headline, right? Reclaiming the Sabbath. The Episcopal Cafe, same idea, Reclaiming the Sabbath. The Catholic Herald, once again, same idea, reclaiming the Sabbath. Even NPR decided to get in on the fun. And uh, they had a story not long ago, Sabbath, good for non-believers too. And uh, last example, Fox News, a couple years ago now, let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake. And then in the article it said, Americans work hard, maybe too hard. How many of you identify with that, right? Hard work. This is an invitation to Jews, Hindus, Muslims, atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, and Christians. One day a week, rest for God's sake. So we're going to look tonight at this topic 
of the Sabbath. And um, it's a very biblical idea. And I hope you have your Bible with you because we're going to be looking at what the Bible says about this day of rest that um, God has given to us. So first question for tonight, when and where did the Sabbath originate? Let's go to the very first book of the Bible. That's the book of Genesis. And you don't have to turn far in Genesis to find the first mention of a day of rest. God creates this world, according to the Bible, in six days. And we find in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, this is the record we have. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So we see the very first thing that the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 verse 1 is that God created this world and God created you. You're not here by accident. And we, we looked at some of those issues several nights ago when we looked at creation and, and what are the odds that we would just be here by chance. And we saw that those odds are so astronomically small that mathematically it's a zero chance. So you have to have faith in something, right? Either you're going to have faith that uh, you just arose by chance, or you're going to have faith that somebody created you. And the very first thing that the Bible tells us is that God in heaven created this world and each one of us here tonight. And the second thing that the Bible tells us is that when he was done with that process of creation, God rested. Now, if you look closely at the wording here in verse 3, it says, God blessed the seventh day, and what else did he do to it? Sanctified it. Sanctified it. Now, that's a word we don't use a lot you know, in our modern world, but it simply means to take something and to set it apart for a special purpose. So you do this all the time. Um, you might think of a special heirloom piece of furniture or uh, whatever you might have in your house, or maybe something more utilitarian that we use all the time, right? If you have a phone that you only use at work, you've sanctified that phone for work purposes. You get the idea. Here is a block of time, the seventh set of 24 hours in that first week that God takes and he sets it apart for a special purpose. And that special purpose is simply to rest and to stop working. So God sets up this model of six days of work followed by one day of rest. And this, this framework of six surrounding one is something that we actually find repeated in nature a lot. You've all seen a honeycomb, right? These are perfect hexagonal shapes, six sides surrounding you know, the interior space here. And this is a pattern that we find repeatedly throughout nature. And uh, <clears throat> mathematicians and uh, biologists and others look at this and they say, okay, why do we see bees creating a hexagonal shaped structure you know, to store their honey? Turns out that the hexagon is the most um, ideal shape and the most economic shape in terms of surface area, if you're looking straight down. So the surface area or volume of honey that they can store versus the amount of material that you have to build your walls from. So perimeter versus surface area. Hexagon is just about as good as you can get. So bees are smart, right? They don't want to work harder than they have to. So they make the hexagonal shape here. Here's a dragonfly. Now, <clears throat> its eyes are one of the most advanced eyes that we know of, that we've discovered. And uh, it's hard to see in this photograph because we're not zoomed in close enough, but there are about 30,000 parts to their eyes. And those parts are each shaped like a hexagon. And uh, again, recurring pattern that you find here. Amazing example there. These are lava columns from a volcano. And it's very interesting that Frequently, you will find these lava columns as they cool and then crack, they also form a very nice hexagon shape. And uh, the geologists were wondering, why is this the case? Turns out as the lava is flowing and then cooling, um, and begins to contract, just like anything does when it cools down. So it shrinks and it contracts and the pressure builds. And um, as it shrinks, it produces more and more pressure until it finally cracks. And it just turns out that the angle that releases the most pressure is 120 degrees, which is the angle 
uh, of a hexagon between the sides there. Very fascinating. Snowflakes, you've heard no two snowflakes are alike, right? As you look up at the San Juans or something like that, it's hard to believe, isn't it? That no two of those snowflakes are just the same. But they are very similar in this respect. They're all built around a basic hexagonal shape or symmetry of six parts uh, with infinite variety. And then this one was fascinating. This is the planet Saturn. And you can see on um, its pole here, there's a hexagon shape, isn't there? This is a massive swirling storm of clouds that they've discovered on Saturn. It's 9,000 miles across, just the blue part of the storm there. So that's that could swallow the Earth right there. And uh, they estimate that the winds inside this cloud are at least 200 miles an hour. So it's like a giant tornado there at the top of Saturn. But again, we find the hexagon shape, or the six around one principle, permeated throughout nature. And then, of course, we have the week, right? Seven days in the week, looking at God's pattern, six days of work followed by one day of rest. So still we have the six surrounding one principle here. Here's what we read, or we're told about the seven-day week. Only the seven-day period of the Hebraic week has survived human history. Its acceptance over such an extensive length of time suggests the seven-day week is not a chance creation. All attempts to reconfigure the duration of the week, including that by the French school system when instituting the broken four-day one, ended disastrously because of physical and or mental intolerance. There have been experiments. There have been other, you know, times, you know, they tried a 10-day week. Here they tried a four-day week. But humanity seems to keep coming back to a seven-day week. So we could ask the question, why? You know, is there a reason for this? And it turns out there just may be a scientific reason as well as a biblical reason. One of the more fascinating things that scientists have been discovering in the last several decades are something called circa septin rhythms. Now, sept is the prefix for seven. So these are biological rhythms in cycles of seven days that they are discovering in many, many different forms of life. Here's one statement from an article about it. These circus septin, or about weekly rhythms, are one of the major surprises turned up by modern chronobiology. Fifteen years ago, few scientists would have expected that seven-day cycles would prove to be so widespread and so long established in the living world. They are of very ancient origin, appearing in the primitive one-celled organisms, and are thought to be present even in bacteria, the simplest form of life now existing. Now, it's not just in bacteria that we find these biological fluctuations that seem to follow a seven-day cycle. How many of you have had chicken pox? Whenever, way back when, right? Chicken pox and many other diseases, uh, the symptoms usually appear after 14 days after you're exposed. So obviously two sets of seven there. Um, other functions in each of our bodies like systolic blood pressure, the enamel deposition on your teeth, even many cognitive functions they have traced to seven-day cycles as they work through your body. Um, seven-day patterns they've also found in infections, kind of mentioned that with chicken pox there. Um, infections also often seem to peak or reach their highest after seven days or in seven days. So, you know, hospitals have figured this out. They keep a special close watch on patients as they approach that seven-day mark. Your gastrointestinal functions, cardiac diseases, uh, even blood clotting peaks seven days after birth. And it's interesting that God told the Hebrews to circumcise their male children on the eighth day after birth. So maybe God knew something here about how the body functions. They found these same kinds of seven-day rhythms in all kinds of animals, algae, rats, mice, Guinea pigs, horses, honeybees, beetles, flies, you name it. It's the whole spectrum of the animal kingdom seems to uh, operate on these kinds of cycles. Many diverse species are known to express seven-day cyclic phenomena, from the simple unicellular Gonulux polyedra to plants, insects, fish, birds, and mammals, laboratory rodents, horses, and humans. From a chronobiologic point of view, it is impossible 
to eliminate the seven-day component from the inherent organization of processes and functions of the biological time structure. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Here we have science delving into what makes life work, and they're finding these seven-day cyclic patterns. Is this an echo of creation week? Has God perhaps built in these cycles into the animal kingdom? What does the Sabbath memorialize? Let's go to the second book of the Bible now. That's the book of Exodus. We're going to go to chapter 20. And this, of course, is the chapter that records the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And we're going to look at the commandment that talks about the Sabbath. That's the fourth commandment. So we're in Exodus 20, beginning in verse number 8. It begins with an important word. What is that word? It says, remember. Now, if, uh, well, I'll just say this. I've got four children. And on occasion, I tell my children to remember something. Now, why would I make a special point to remember something? It's because I have this feeling that they just might forget. Or past experience has taught me that they're very liable to forget this. And to be fair, my wife says the same thing when she hands me a grocery list and I go to the store. She says, now remember this and don't forget it. Why would God start this commandment? He doesn't say this on any of the others. It's just the fourth commandment. He says, remember. Because he knew we as humans would be liable to forget this one. Okay, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So according to this commandment, whose day is it? It's God's day, right? It's not just the Jews' day. And, you know, a lot of folks sometimes will say, well, these Ten Commandments, and especially the Sabbath, was intended for the Jews or just for Israel in the Old Testament. But here God is saying that it belongs to him. We see that in Creation Week. He gave the example. He rested. And now he's saying, I'm reminding you of something that you should already know, but maybe you've forgotten. This day belongs to me. So the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. It's interesting that God also mentions the animals, right? I wonder if cows have septicircan rhythms too. Maybe they need a day to rest. With all that chewing, I would certainly want a little rest, right? <laughs> Verse 11, now God gives the reason for the Sabbath commandment. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And he rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And that word hallowed is really just another word for sanctified. It's a reminder that he took that block of 24 hours and he set it apart for a special purpose. So there's really two parts here to the Sabbath commandment that we see in Exodus 20. The first part is a reminder that this day belongs to God. Now, why would God need to remind a bunch of slaves that have spent the last couple hundred years in slavery? Why would he need to remind them that this day belonged to him? Because as slaves, they couldn't keep the Sabbath. You know, the Egyptians didn't care. They had to work. And um, so God is reminding them that there is a day that belongs to your creator. That's the first part we see. The second part that we see in this commandment is that this is a day, yes, to worship God, but part of keeping the Sabbath is working those first six days, right? So the Sabbath commandment is also about ceasing from our work on that seventh day, just like God did, right? God's not asking us to do anything that he hasn't done. He worked for six days. He created for six days. He rested on the seventh and now he gives this invitation for us to follow his example and to join him in his rest because it's his day. I don't know what kind of engine this is. I don't even know what kind of vehicle it goes in. But I do know this. No matter what you drove in tonight to get here, you had some kind of engine in your vehicle. Now, the engineers that built this, did they just throw the parts together haphazardly and say, whew, I hope that works? Of course not. Every piece of equipment 
is carefully designed and it has an exact purpose. And if you're missing any one of those, the engine's not going to work correctly. And likely, it may not work at all. The Sabbath is kind of like this engine, right? It has a specific purpose that the Creator has designed for it. And if we yank this part of our existence away from our lives, we're not going to operate very smoothly. We're not going to operate the way God wants us to. And we're not going to have that rest, physically or spiritually, that God intends that we have. So you are a finely crafted engine, much finer than any kind of engine in a car. And uh, God has given you everything, given us everything he knows that we need to operate at our optimum and to have that relationship with him. Let's look at another, another Bible verse, Ezekiel 20, verse 12. So this is later in the Old Testament. Ezekiel lived about the time of Daniel. In fact, he was among the captives that were taken off to Babylon. And uh, this is what Ezekiel, or God said through Ezekiel concerning the Sabbath. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. So the Sabbath we see has two big purposes or functions. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, the fourth commandment, tells us that the Sabbath is a memorial of creation, right? When we enter into that Sabbath rest on the seventh day, we are reminded that God is our creator, and he rested, therefore I'm going to rest like he did. The second purpose for the Sabbath is brought out in this verse, and that is it is a reminder that God not only can sanctify time, something as abstract and immaterial as time, but he can also sanctify you. He can sanctify his people, and he wants to do that. In fact, he's much more concerned about sanctifying you even than the day of, uh, a day of the week, as important as that is. They actually go together. So the Sabbath is also a reminder that um, God sanctifies us. He wants to set each one of us apart for a special purpose. We find this same idea in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, Verse 10 says, For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. So the rest we're invited to enter into is God's rest. He that has entered into God's rest has ceased from his own works. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that people sometimes uh, will say or ask when uh, you start studying about this topic of the Seventh-day Sabbath They'll say, well, that was just for the Jews. And if we are worried or concerned about a specific day now, then we're being legalistic, right? Uh, maybe you've heard some of those arguments or suggestions before. Actually, this verse tells us here that the way we are protected from legalism and trying to work our way into heaven is to enter into God's rest. That if we truly want to express our faith in Jesus as the one who saves us from our sins, then one of the ways we do that is by entering into his rest. There is a gigantic flat salt plain in uh, Bolivia, way up in the highlands of the Andes Mountains. Salar de Ayuni, I hope I came close to pronouncing that correctly. And um, it's 12,000 feet high. These are the world's largest salt flats and they form the border between Bolivia and Chile. They're nearly 4,000 square miles. Most of the year, they look like the picture on the left there, just a big flat desert. But when the rainy season comes, uh, they fill up with just a little bit of water and it forms almost a perfect mirror, 4,000 square miles. And satellites actually use this to recalibrate themselves as they fly overhead because it's the biggest mirror, flat mirror surface on earth when it's full of water. And we all need a recalibration, just like a satellite needs to recalibrate occasionally as it circles the earth. Each one of us needs a recalibration as we cycle through our lives. You know, God has built a weekly recalibration experience into creation for each one of us, and that's the seventh day Sabbath. And uh, he knows that we need a recalibration every seventh day. In fact, he even built these cycles into us, right? 
And I just, God is amazing and his creation is amazing. How many thousands of years have gone by before we started discovering these circus septon rhythms? Yet they've been there all along. And um, this is an opportunity that comes by once every week where God says, hey, just rest, stop from your work, stop from your busyness, slow down a little bit, breathe and recalibrate and focus on your relationship with me, your relationship with other people. Let's look at the New Testament testimony that's given. On what day did Jesus worship? We find the answer in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up for to read. And um, we see Jesus worshiping on the Sabbath day. If we want to follow his example, which is what we should do as Christians, right? Then... Uh, the invitation, again, is for us to do the same thing that our Savior did and uh, worship God on the Sabbath day here. Now, let's um, do our best to answer a few questions. Which day is the seventh day? You know, one of the questions people have is, how do we know that Saturday is still the seventh day of the week? I mean, it's been thousands of years since creation. How can we know or have confidence that that weekly cycle hasn't gotten thrown off kilter or out of adjustment at some point. So there's several ways that um, we can answer this question. First of all, from the biblical sequence of the crucifixion weekend, we can locate the Sabbath. And you see the verses referenced here on the screen. Jesus died on a day that we call Good Friday. The Bible also calls this the preparation day. One of the things about the Sabbath was that the people were not just to Work, 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 sundown, boom. And then here's the Sabbath. They were actually to prepare the day before. So the sixth day of the week was called Preparation Day. And Jesus dies on this day, or Good Friday, the day before the Sabbath. And when the sun went down, the women rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. That's in Luke 23, verse 56. And Jesus... Uh, rose, as we know, on Sunday, the first day of the week. And the Bible makes this clear in Luke 24, verse 1, that uh, he rises on the first day of the week. So if you look at the sequence that the Bible gives us here, the women rest according to the commandment there in Luke 23, verse 56. And then Jesus rises the next day, which is the first day of the week. Now, one of the things we shouldn't miss about this is that the gospel of Luke was written many years after this event. We don't know exactly which year it was written, but probably decades after uh, the actual events here, the resurrection and the life of Jesus. And it's still being referred to, the Sabbath is still being referred to according to the commandment here. So here's a piece of evidence we have from the New Testament that the, the Sabbath commandment was never changed. If it had been, Luke would have said something to this effect. And the women rested on the Sabbath, which was the Jews' Sabbath. In the Gospel of John, when John is talking about the Passover, more than once he says the Jews' Passover. He makes a very careful point to make it clear that the Passover was a Jewish feast day or a Jewish holiday, if we can use that word. That distinction is never made in the New Testament. It simply says the Sabbath according to the commandment. Here's another reason. The calendar has changed, for example, once in the year 1582, and it changed from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. So Thursday, October 4 in that year was followed by Friday, October 15. However, this change did not affect the cycle of days. It just still went from Thursday to Friday. So the weekly cycle has never changed during that change of the calendar. Number three, the Jewish people have been observing the seventh day for thousands of years, and they still keep it today, right? So we have an entire race, nation of people, an entire religion that goes back thousands of years. They have kept track of the Sabbath, and we still have that record today. Number four, over 100 languages use the word Sabbath for Saturday. For example, the Spanish word for Saturday is sabado, meaning Sabbath. And um, you can find this in 108 languages, I believe, if I remember correctly. Webster's Dictionary states Saturday is the seventh day of the week and Sunday is the first day of the week. And the World Book Encyclopedia says Sabbath comes 
on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. Okay, on what day did the early Christian church worship? We can again find some evidence here in the New Testament for what day the early Christians met on. So, hope you have your Bible again. We'll see one of these verses on screen, but we're going to look at a few more just in our Bibles. We're going to go to Acts 18, verse 4. Book of Acts, chapter 18, and verse number 4. So Paul is in Corinth at this part of the record. And... Um, I'm going to start in verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla. And he came unto them. Verse 3, And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And now verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, we would expect the Jews to be in the synagogue on the Sabbath, but it's all, the Bible also makes it clear that the Greek converts to Christianity here, they were also meeting on the Sabbath day. Now, let's look up a few more verses in the New Testament. Go to Acts chapter 13. Back a few pages. Acts chapter 13 and uh, verse 14 will be our first verse. Let's actually start in verse 13. So Acts 13, verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, de John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. So once again, the Bible's clear. They're going to worship here on the seventh day or the Sabbath. We can jump forward in the same chapter to verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So again, here the Bible is making it very clear that both the Jews and the Gentiles were meeting on the same day. Verse 44, same chapter. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Paul must have been holding quite a set of meetings, right? <laughs> because the whole city becomes interested in what he has to say. Just a couple more verses here. Acts chapter 16 and verse 13. Acts chapter 16, verse 13. And we'll find the same thing. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. As we work our way through the book of Acts, and we see Paul, especially in the others, apostles setting up churches in these different uh, cities, different Greek cities, the Bible is consistent that they were worshiping on the Sabbath, worshiping on the Sabbath. Acts chapter 17. Now we're in Thessalonica. Verse 1, chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyona, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. When you look through the book of Acts especially, there were some things that these early Christians disagreed on. And there were some pretty heated discussions at times as they tried to sort out what needs to be kept from uh, the Jewish traditions and rituals, what needs to be discarded. You know, one of the big topics was circumcision. Is this something that the, the uh, Greek and Gentile converts should be required to do, or do we not make a big deal of it? They also talked about food being sacrificed to idols and things like this. And we find record of this you know, throughout the New Testament where they're discussing these things, and they, they pray, and they, they, uh, they study together, and they arrive at a conclusion through the Holy Spirit's leading. But one thing you never find the early Christians debating or discussing about 
is which day to worship on, which day is the Sabbath. There is absolute silence regarding this, which is very strong evidence that they were all worshiping on the same day. Even Jesus, uh, during his life and ministry, he had a lot of run-ins with the leaders of the Jews about the Sabbath issue, but it was never which day was it. It was what should you do on the Sabbath day. Jesus was um, persecuted by them because he was actually healing people and helping people <laughs> on the Sabbath. And uh, they had piled on so many human regulations on top of God's simple commandment to cease from work and worship him that uh, they had almost completely forgotten what the Sabbath was really about. It had become a burden. They had all kinds of rules, over 600 additional rules to help them not break the Sabbath. And uh, you could only walk a certain distance. And if you walk too many steps and you didn't plan correctly, you just have to sit down and wait for the Sabbath to end before you could go back home. Or you couldn't, you couldn't pick heads of grain as you walked because that would be harvesting and, and that was work. Or you couldn't do this. You couldn't only carry so much with you because if you carried more than you were working. And it was, it was these ideas that were layered on top of God's simple command of the Sabbath that Jesus was really working to free them from. But again, in the life of Christ, you never see any discussion or persecution because he was telling the people to worship on a different day. It simply is not there in the Bible. And this fact that the Bible is completely silent as to a change in this fourth commandment after the time of Christ is well recognized. And it has been for a long, long time by Christians from all different denominations. Here's just a short sample. So Sir William Domville from the Church of England said centuries of the Christian era passed away before the Sunday was observed by the Christian church as a Sabbath. History does not furnish us with a single proof or indication that it was at any time so observed previous to the sabbatical edict of Constantine in AD 321. So we're talking about a lapse of several hundred years before this change really becomes uh, something significant. Philip Carrington, Archbishop of Quebec. The Bible commandment says, on the seventh day thou shalt rest. That is Saturday. Nowhere in the Bible is it laid down that worship should be done on Sunday. And you've heard of Dwight Moody. Here's what he said about this issue. The Sabbath was binding in Eden, and it has been in force ever since. This fourth commandment begins with the word remember showing that the Sabbath already existed when God wrote this law on the tables of stone at Sinai. Now, that's a really good point, isn't it? Were other parts of God's law already in existence before God actually wrote on the tables of stone? How about that commandment that says, thou shalt not kill? Do you think that was important before Mount Sinai? And we have the story of Cain and Abel, right? Just years, a few short years after Adam and Eve make their mistake, Cain kills his brother and God holds him accountable for it. There was no written law on stone, but obviously that, that commandment was there, thou shalt not kill. So let's finish Moody's statement here. How can men claim that this one commandment has been done away with when they will admit that the other nine are still standing? That's a good question, isn't it? How many of you remember this event? Space Shuttle Challenger, 1987. This is one of the first big news stories I remember. Made a big impression on me. And if you remember that, there was a lot of hype around this particular space shuttle launch because there was a civilian on board, uh, Christy McAuliffe, I believe, the teacher. And um, within... A minute or two after launch, you know what happened. The, the entire space shuttle blew up. Everybody on board, of course, died. So what happened? Why the disaster? Well, as NASA did their investigation, they finally zeroed in on a tiny little O-ring, just a few centimeters in diameter. And this O-ring had failed. And part of the reason it had failed is because the temperatures were so cold that it had frozen and so forth. And so they continued their investigation and they said, okay, so the O-ring failed, but why didn't we catch this, you know, in all of our preparation? 
And as they continued studying into this and researching, they finally decided it was human error. There had actually been a warning that was given to the engineers, you know, helping with the launch. But the team of engineers was so sleep deprived that they either ignored the report or they didn't really realize what it was saying. A lack of sleep, a lack of rest can be deadly. And this is why God gives us the Sabbath. Started in Eden, you go through the entire Bible. It's never been changed. It's still there. And today God is inviting each one of us to join him every week to recalibrate on his Sabbath day, the seventh day. Revelation 14, verse 7. This is an angel. This is a message for our time. If you look in the flow of prophecies in Revelation, chapter 14 is way down at the end of time, just before Jesus comes back. And look at what this angel says. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And what? Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. How do we worship God as creator? The Bible gives us a very clear way by remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. At this moment, we're going to pass out the response cards, and I'd like everybody to get one, please, if we can pass these out. And uh, we'll collect these before we're finished here, but I want to give you a chance to respond to this message um, and what the Bible is saying to you tonight, what Jesus is saying to you. So the first line says, I recognize that the seventh day of the week, Saturday, is still God's holy Sabbath of rest and worship. So if that's clear to you from the Bible, from what we've looked at tonight, please mark that first box there. The second box beneath it says, I choose to rest from my work and worship God on his Sabbath day. If that's your desire, if that's your commitment, if you feel Jesus' personal invitation to you to join him in that rest on the seventh day of each week, please mark that box right there. And then as we've had with each of these cards, if you have questions that you want to discuss in a more one-on-one -on -one or personal way, please let us know, and we'll make sure that we can do that. We're going to have a special music right now, and then we'll come back for a few more questions and a little more discussion on the Sabbath. Okay, yeah, great topic. And uh, I, I did hear that somebody actually did a, a question online and it made it up. Is that true? Yes, yeah, it's yeah. true. Okay. It's true. So whoever that brave soul was, we encourage more of your bravery. Uh, let us know what your, what's on your, your thoughts, what's on your hearts. Um, we just uh, visited with somebody over in Delta this, today. They said that they've been really enjoying. It's a little bit of a drive for them over here, but they've been really enjoying going to the meetings. So a special hello to you. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions that have come up, this is a good, good way to get them taken care of. So without further ado, let's jump in. So this question says, if the Bible really says that the seventh day is the Sabbath, why do almost all Christian churches worship on Sunday? That's a good question. Good question, right? <clears throat> um, you know, one way to look at this is to simply ask some other questions. If the Bible was so clear about who the Messiah would be, we looked at all those prophecies, right? That revealed where the Messiah would be born, what his character would be like, how he would die, even down to when he would die. If the Bible was so clear about that, how could he be rejected by his own people? You know? So just because the majority is believing or doing something isn't necessarily an indication that that thing is true. Um, it doesn't mean that it's also wrong. We have to come back to this book right here, and we have to study this. We have to pray that God will guide us in our study, and we need to personally and individually know what the Bible says um, for ourselves. Unfortunately, it's just not safe to follow people, whether it's a small group or a big group. <laughs> fair, fair point. <clears throat> Hence the, the need for the Word of God. Okay, let's see. So this one says, define um, word. Uh, what about uh, washing cleanings? Let me see if I got that right. Define word. 
work. There we go. Define work. Define work. What about, uh, oh, okay. What about washing and cleaning? Yeah. Does that fall under the category of, of work? <clears throat> well, what's the purpose of the Sabbath? Is the purpose to wash your clothes or is the purpose to worship God? As far as possible, we need to do everything that we can do to clear out these routine, regular things that we do in our lives. Um, even as important as washing your clothes is. Thank you for doing that, by the way. It's important to wash your clothes, but it can be done on other days of the week. And there's a reason that, and I mentioned this, that the day before the sixth day of the week is and was referred to as the preparation day. Things like preparing food, uh, washing of clothes, getting your house prepared and so forth. That's what the preparation day is for. And I'll, I'll say this for my family. My wife and I have discovered this um, over the years is that preparation for Sabbath actually can't begin the day before. It actually starts on day number one of the week. And to really, truly be prepared for Sabbath, we have to be planning for it all week long. And uh, it's not that it's a burden to do that. It's just that it's in your mind and you're thinking about it and you're thinking, OK, if I don't do this now, I'm going to have to do it late on Friday afternoon and it's not going to go well. Um, and so preparation is important. Washing your clothes, you know, um, <clears throat> if Jesus talked about oxes in the ditch, right? So you cut yourself. Sabbath morning, wash yourself, clean yourself up, right? Um, if it's just the routine laundry, probably there's another time of the week you can do that that will not be distracting your attention when Sabbath comes. That's a, that's a great answer. We uh, reminded me, I don't remember if you looked at this already, but in, in Exodus 16, it talks about the gathering of the food, they gather it on the first day, the second day, the third, fourth, fifth, yes. and sixth. On the sixth day, they gather twice as much so that they don't have to go out and do the routine gathering of the manna. And that was actually a way that, that God was training them how to keep the Sabbath after being in captivity for, for so long. And no manna fell on the seventh day of the week. So they had to prepare on the sixth day. Yeah, that's exactly If they right. didn't, they would have no food to eat on the seventh day. Yeah, that, I think that's an interesting uh, object lesson there, too. I, I also, you, you mentioned that you, you start on, on Sunday to prepare for, for Sabbath. And uh, I, I have some relatives that, uh, at least this year, they kept, yeah, started December 1st, and they marked on their calendar every single day leading up to December 25th, mm -hmm. uh, or 24th in their case. And uh, that the anticipation, the excitement, the building, okay, this is, you know, and this is how a lot of the, the Jews treat the Sabbath too, is it's, a, it's their favorite day of the week. And we tend to prepare in special ways for the days that we look forward to the most. It's, it's a holiday. It's a holy day. That's right. Okay, let's take a look at the next one here. It says, doesn't the Bible say that Sunday is the Lord's day? Okay, so... This is a phrase you'll see used a lot, right, in reference to the day of worship, the Lord's Day. Um, there are really only two verses in the Bible that use that phrase, so we'll look at both of them. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. This is kind of the introduction to the book as John is explaining where and when he received this vision. And in Revelation chapter 1... Uh, verse 9, he says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that John was willing to suffer persecution for what this book said right here, for the word of God. And um, we should be too, right? We should be willing to uh, follow God wherever it leads. Now, in verse 10, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So he simply says that he received this vision on the Lord's day, but this doesn't say what day is the Lord's day. So we have to go back to the book of Isaiah, which is the other place where we see this uh, title given to the Sabbath. Isaiah chapter 58. <clears throat> 
And God will make it very clear here which day is his day. We're going to Isaiah chapter 58. Looking at verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Now we'll read the promise in the next verse in just a moment. But don't miss that in verse 13, God clearly identifies the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, as my holy day, as his holy day. And you don't find any other place in Scripture where he identifies any other day of the week, whether Old Testament, New Testament. This is the only place. Now, what's the promise? Look at verse 14. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Beautiful promise. Amen. Wonderful. Okay, we've got another question here. It says, I worship God every day. Why would God want me to, or want our worship to just, to just the Sabbath, be just on the Sabbath day of the week or on the seventh day of the week? Or, or we limited go. maybe only to go. one day. Yeah. Uh, so yes, this is one thing that people often say, well, every day is the Sabbath, right? Every day is the day I worship God. And I would say, praise the Lord, right? We should worship God every single day of the week. But the Sabbath commandment is very particular and it's very defined. Not only is it a day to worship God, but it's also a day to cease from our work. And that fourth commandment in Exodus 20 makes that very clear. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And then it goes on again. And, it, you, you know, and it's interesting, in, in Exodus 20 there, <clears throat> now let's turn there once again. Rather than talking about it, we will read it. Exodus chapter 20. Look at verse 10, please. Exodus 20, verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter. So this is also applying to your family, right? It's not just you. It impacts the family as well. And then it says thy maidservant, or the manservant, nor thy maidservant, so those that work for you. Also, give them the day off as well. Don't make other people do your work on that seventh day. God wants them to rest as well. Um, nor thy stranger, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. This applies to everybody, right? <laughs> uh, there's nobody excluded from this part of the commandment. And so very clearly, uh, part of the Sabbath commandment is not only that I cease from work or that you cease from work, but it's that you're not laying the burden of work on somebody else during that day as well. Yeah. And an, an important thing to realize that, you know, worshiping in that sense where you're resting every day, uh, if you do that every, seven days a week, you wouldn't be holy. You'd be lazy. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Interesting. You just went to Exodus uh, 20 because this next question it's kind of answered by the verses you just read, but it says, do animals need a seventh day rest? Yeah. According to the Bible, we should be willing to give that to them, right? Yeah. Very good. I don't know how many of us have beasts of labor, but maybe <laughs> some of us still. But here's another question. It says, what Bible verse or verses would somebody use to say the Sabbath has been changed? <clears throat> there are none. <laughs> you can, there are eight references to the first day of the week or to Sunday in the New Testament. And um, before you leave tonight, we're going to give each family here a book that summarizes what the Bible says about the Sabbath. And each one of those eight Bible verses are in that booklet. I mean, you can look them up for yourself in your own Bible, but never in the New Testament do you see any reference to Jesus or the apostles or later down the road, you know, the early church saying we are now switching to another day to worship. It's just not there. Wow. Okay, the Bible says, uh, let's see, it says, the Bible says that Jesus fulfilled the law. This seems conclusive that the Sabbath requirement was done away with at the cross. Well, if that's true, 
then he also did away with the commandment to not kill. And he also did away with the commandment to not commit adultery or to not steal. Right? You get the point, right? If what that verse means, and that's in Romans 6, we actually dealt with that verse a couple of nights ago. If it really means that Jesus has, when it says Jesus has fulfilled the law, meaning that he's done away with it, then it truly is a free-for-all, right? And the strongest and the fastest and the smartest guy is going to end up with all the toys. And that's not what the Bible says. So we have to look at the Ten Commandments as a whole. You, we cannot chisel out one or pick out one and treat it differently than we treat the rest of the Ten Commandments.